Hi, Dr. Mala. It's great to see you. Hi, Jeff. It's great to be here with you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Growing up, I come from a generation of alcoholics. My father was an attorney. I spend my teenage years having my dad show up so drunk that I had to get him out of the car into the house, you know, and those kind of events really affected me. And then I had an early addiction myself. I started drinking probably when I was 15 years old and then using a lot of drugs. And then it got into a lot of abuse for a solid 10 years till I was about 25, 26 years old. So there's a whole history there. And I've always had a passion for so many people around me were struggling with addiction. And I've always felt like that impulse to want to better my life, but also to better other people's life, to trying to benefit, to help them, trying to navigate how do we get ourselves out of this. And I was raised on the South Shore of Montreal. Oh, wonderful. I don't know how I feel about the term toxic masculinity, mm. but I, I grew up in a culture. My, my grandpa was 82nd Airborne, World War II, Three Purple Hearts. My dad was an all-American football player and a professional boxer. Some of the things you mentioned in your book, I'll give you something to cry about, wait till your father gets yes. home. Yep. Those were things that resonated clearly with me. Mm -hmm. I was a, a, an empath as a young boy. Uh, I was a feeler and I was emotional, or I was until I was told that that's not the way we're supposed to be. Did, did you have that type of upbringing as well? I did, and the message didn't come straight the same way. My father was absent, so that left a hole in my life. And my mother was very sort of unpredictable in the way that she behaved. So for me, the message I got was very similar in terms of, yeah, I'm not that important, right? There's more important things in life to pay attention to. And I also learned my mother, because she had a lot of emotion when I was young and a lot of outbursts of emotion. So for me, I learned that those outbursts were scary, right? So I learned like to fear my emotions based on that. I think for most men, that message came from having a strong father present in the household, right? For men who were raised mostly by mothers, unless the mother was dominating, right? Like in terms of Mine was dominating with anxiety, not so much mm -hmm. with, you know, don't cry, don't be like your brother necessarily. But I think no matter what the influence that we receive, I think what's epidemic in our society is that we do get the message that our emotions are not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. is so strong across the board. It's even for women oftentimes where they feel a need to express their emotion, but then will have shame after expressing their emotion. Like, was I too much? And it's, it's a very unfortunate way of living because as I talk about it in Addicted to the Monkey Mind is that, that the emotional body possess intelligence. And by utilizing that intelligence, we can really transform our experience mm -hmm. and we can surely navigate addiction in so much better by understanding that so much of what leads us to those urges is unmanaged emotion, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Unaddressed emotions that keep festering in us. Oh yeah. You say it so well, the monkey mind keeps a memory bank of all criticisms and judgments that we've adopted from our programming. Right. And arguably, as you're saying now, from the beginning, we're just collecting those throughout our life. So yeah. the reminders, and you mentioned this as well, you know, the shame inducing beliefs that we hang on to, the narratives that form because of that, the things that we might interpret here and now as this is what helps me survive. How do you navigate that? And I know you go into that in the book, but for our audience, what can you recommend? Well, what's tricky about shame is most people have double shame. And this is one of the main reason, and they're not really fully conscious of that. So the first shame is when we start noticing that we do a behavior, right? Or we do something and we start criticizing ourselves for the way we're behaving or what we're doing or what we think is not up to par, 
But now what happens is many people make effort and they start thinking, okay, I want to change that behavior. I want to start making some step forward. And as they do, they're not changing or they're having difficulty changing. And now they start shaming themselves for that. Mm -hmm. Right. So first you have the struggle. Now you're trying to change, but you're not changing. So now you start judging yourself and pounding even more on yourself. And this dynamic is ingrained in us, right? Like in the book, what is most quoted is that the promise of shame is that it'll make you a better person, mm -hmm. right? But the result of shame is that it makes you feel worthless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. that's that's the key, right? It's, it's like, so if we keep subscribing to shame and on top of it, addiction, you know, it's been really proving with so much study that shame and isolation, that combination is really what will forever perpetuate an addiction, right? Those two combined together. Yeah. What's strange about, I think for most people is the concept, I talk about that in Addicted to the Monkey Mind is how do we actually make shame our ally? Because if we're actually fighting against shame, what we're actually doing is kind of what Einstein said so brilliantly, right? You can't use the same mindset that created the problem trying to get rid of it. You, you'll never reach it that way, right? So when we're addressing our shame with a critical way of looking at it or thinking that we need to get rid of it, now we're in conflict. We're creating more tension. Here's the other thing that at the center I was really shocked by is I see there's an obsession in addiction to measure our progress and our success by whether we stop drinking or not, or whether we stop using or not. Mm -hmm. And for me early on, what I discovered is that that's very misleading, meaning it's okay to want to stop a behavior, right? That's perfectly, I mean, that's a great goal to have, but it's different when we start building an identity around our behaviors. And what I would often say to people, look, you can never be a behavior. Do you realize that? You can't be a behavior. That will never be you. You might be stuck in a behavior, but you're not that behavior. And a lot of the things that can help shift a little bit at the beginning is to think of an addiction more like a peanut allergy. If you have a peanut allergy, you don't walk around saying to people, hi, I'm a peanut allergy. That would make no sense. But if you go eat at a restaurant and you know there might be peanut in your food, you make sure to tell the waiter, hey, listen, make sure there's no peanut in my food. And what that translates to in addiction is to begin, like I say, the first step is what I call putting a stake in the ground. Mm -hmm. And what that looks like is wherever you go, because all of us, oftentimes it's better if you avoid situation where there might be a lot of drinking. Yes, I get that. But it's not fully avoidable, right? Oftentimes you go to your in-laws and everybody else is drinking and you're not. And so to begin with and to begin working with the shame, and this is very challenging, but it's really effective when we begin to create security within ourselves by making a statement that that in a commitment to ourselves that anytime anyone is going to offer us a drink, that we're going to tell a statement of truth about ourselves and whatever level of comfort you have about that truth, but very different than saying, no, thank you, or no, thank you. I don't drink. So the step further is, you know what? Alcohol has hurt me. It's hurt my marriage. I don't drink anymore, but I'd love a lemonade. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing that most of us are terrified of is that when we start that process of facing our shame, because our shame is actually based on the stories that we tell ourselves and what other people think about us. Yeah. That's the core of shame. But when we tell the truth of someone, we're actually in a real experience now. We're not in a story anymore. And so we're actually interacting. We have an opportunity to face that shame. And here's what we will witness. If we're willing to take the risk, there are one of two things that's going to happen. Either the person will reject you because they are part of the drinking tribe. They might even think, oh, this person is such a party pooper or whatever. I don't want to be with them. And in that rejection, if you stay conscious and look at the person, you realize, are they really rejecting you or the fact that you're not drinking? Mm -hmm. And so pay attention, stay present with that. But then the other thing that will happen is it will create connection. And I've tested this and I've seen it over and over where someone will say, you know what, 
I love my uncle. I've been really close to him and he has a drinking problem and it's been really hard. I think it's very brave of you to say that. And it's just like, now suddenly you're in connection and that's the very thing that starts healing shame, right? Is to get out of isolation, to get out of these habitual stories that dominate our psyche, right? But to make them available to us in a very evidence-based way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, JF, when my, you had my head spinning here, I, I, I'm, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I'm, I'm okay saying that, or I'm in long-term recovery from substance use disorder, alcohol. You've probably heard the saying, uh, the worst thing for an alcoholic is a head full of AA and a belly full of beer, right? I think <laughs> yeah. that's the shame thing, right? Where, yeah. where, oh no, I drank again. And that program has been a big part of my recovery program. It's not the entirety of it. But there's some real harm there with the failure thing and counting the days and all that. So it sounds like you're a proponent of harm reduction. Is that fair? Yes. Yes. And it's really important to understand. I think there's some misunderstanding about harm reduction. Okay. And it's again, looking at the success rate, we're never saying to someone, put yourself at risk. Okay. Because that's counterproductive. So what's most important is to measure my level of comfort as a person who's in shame. I need to be able to take risk in small doses, right? So if I go too big, if I jump, like, for example, maybe don't go say that to your boss, right? Like maybe you're not ready for that, but you might be ready to say it to a friend, right? Or maybe a colleague. The key here is to start measuring recovery much more about your ability to navigate shame. What we saw at the center is the more we were able to help people truly navigate their emotional body, their pain, their shame that they're having, we saw the urges diminish, mm -hmm. literally like just diminish because you know, the classic saying, and I say that in the book, where you ask people when you oftentimes when they're at the beginning stages, you say, well, why do you drink? And they say, well, I drink. I go to social event mostly to take the edge off. And then I would stop and I say, have you ever stopped to think what edge are you talking about? Right. Yeah. Right. There's an edge there. What, what is that? <laughs> like, and, and we don't realize that the edge is an anxiety about belonging. It's an anxiety of I'm not sure I might say some, the wrong thing or I, I might not be up to par at this event. There's all kinds of fear, right, that are present and they're all related to our sense of self-worth. And it's difficult because shame, the promise of shame is an attempt to keep our self-worth, really. That's really what it's there for, but it destroys our self-worth. That's the, the irony of it. The promise is there. But what it does is the opposite. And you talk about beliefs a lot. Yeah. And, and it was really powerful the way you describe a belief. I wrote it down. A recurring thought you always assume is true. Right. That's a belief. And I think shame comes from, I may be wrong, but I think I have this. I'm behaving in a way that's different than the way I'm supposed to behave because of this belief, this convention that society has taught me. Is that accurate? Yeah, it's the conditioning that we receive that we repeat in our own monkey mind. And we actually bought into the belief that this will make us a better person, right? So one belief that's real simple is if I criticize myself, it'll get me to change. Right. That's how my mother did it, right? So here's the thing that's even deeper than that is if you want to know what you believe, you don't even need to ask yourself what you think. You only have to go and notice the feeling that you're having. Right. Aware. Because beliefs are creating feelings in the body and they're a direct result of those beliefs. So if you really want to know what you believe, go to your belly and ask yourself how you feel and that how this emotion came to be. It came to be by that belief that you're holding. I think 
the biggest trouble about all this and about shame is that it creates a distorted view of who we are. And as long as we keep perpetuating this distorted view, we keep not feeling, we keep repressing, denying, or most people either explode with their emotions or implode with their emotion or freeze with their emotions. None of that has to do with attuning to our emotions. Yeah. Attuning is a radical skill that we can learn, which is to meet ourselves where we're at in the pain that we're having, in the anxiety that we're having. When we are able to do that, we can actually also experience a deeper truth about who we are. I'll give you an example. It really cracks me up when a lot of people, when they've been drinking for so long, and they think of themselves really as, I mean, the term that we hear more often is like, I'm a piece of shit or something that radical that just means like, it's very demeaning to the person. And then I'd say to them, so if we look at everything you've overcome or that you've navigated in 20 years of drinking, let's say, you've gone to three marriages and you're still standing, is that really like... To me, the person who's standing is a resilient person, isn't it? I mean, I know you're still struggling with, with drinking, but the fact that you're still standing, the fact that you're here trying again and again and again, isn't that pure resiliency? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole aspect of recovery that I rarely see. I call it resourcing. And that's why I introduced the observing mind in Addicted to the Monkey Mind, because that's a form of resourcing, the ability to really see ourselves much more accurately of who the real person we are. Yeah. Did it stop the person from being a caring parent, for example? Even if they missed all the soccer game or whatever because they had a drinking problem, deep down inside there's still a person who deeply cares about their children. Even if they could really meet the idea of the ideal parent they would have loved to be, the caring person is still there, right? So again, we are not our behaviors. And I think that's the hardest thing for a person who's stuck in shame and addiction to understand. They keep believing that they are their behavior, that their behavior is defining who they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's so painful. It is. So painful. So for our audience, can you explain the concept of the monkey mind? What is the monkey mind and, and how does it define our decision-making processes? In a form that I think can demonstrate it the best is the monkey mind is a mindset that is based in trauma. So we all receive different levels of trauma growing up. Like Cliff was saying, a comment that says, don't be a crybaby, that's a form of trauma. The monkey mind is formed by moments after moments after moments of those types of corrections. So it's the monkey mind is a corrective mindset. So think of it this way. When we are raised initially from about zero to three years old, the corrections are all about survival. They're like, don't put your finger in the electrical outlet. Don't put that in your mouth. And by the time, a lot of people don't know this, by the time we're three years old, we've actually formed a full conscience. We actually know what's wrong from right, not from a moral perspective, but from a survival perspective. We know that these are the things we need to do to, be, to stay alive and be part of the tribe. Now, past three years old, when we start being four or five, the corrections continue, but now they start attacking our character, meaning they are all about, this is what you need to do to belong in, in this tribe here. So the comments are, you're not going to wear that to school, are you? Like all sorts of corrections that make you feel like somehow you're not enough just the way you are. And then develops over time, by the time we're teenagers, we kind of have a pretty strong monkey mind there, which is the first default place we go in our thinking is being critical of ourselves. It becomes a default place to go, right? So if we go and do a test at school, what's the first thing we do and we didn't do as well as we thought? 
we start criticizing ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's this creates a disconnection from the emotional body because it creates a, a tendency to over attach to this monkey mind and believe that this monkey mind has all the answers and we subscribe to it. And part of subscribing full line and sinker to that monkey mind is to fully disconnect from the emotional body. Mm -hmm. yeah. And our caregiver demonstrates that, right? So think of it, if you come home with a bad report card, what is the first thing that the parents focus on? They focus on your grades. They'll say, hey, listen, you got to see now, this is not acceptable. The conversation goes about the grade. If we were raised in an attachment way, the parent would actually put the, the grades aside and they would actually greet the, the child and say, I noticed that your grades are fluctuating right now. Are you okay? Mm -hmm. What is happening? And the real attachment happens at a connection level. And this is something that our parents didn't know. Their intention was good. If I correct you, you'll change your behavior. You'll succeed in life. What they don't realize is the more I correct you, the more your sense of self, your sense of self-confidence is slowly diminishing. Mm -hmm. And as it's diminishing, then you're not becoming a successful adult now. You're becoming an adult who likes to criticize yourself and then question your own sense of self-worth at every turn. And we do that. I mean, it's amazing. I've seen this dynamic play out with billionaires, with people who have all their resources, huge success, they still have the same mindset. Their partner can make one statement and they are triggered all the way to China and they don't know how to respond, but that's because they're still operating from that monkey mind. We can't escape it. Right. It doesn't matter your financial status or where you're at in life. This is something that exists and ingrained in the fabric of our society, you know? Yeah. I mean, the brain, What what is it that we say, right? We could have many good things happen to us, but somehow our minds will go back to what could potentially go wrong. And for what reason? To survive, to help us survive. So that monkey mind, as you're saying it, is that survival mechanism. So using it for ourselves so that we can optimize it becomes the key. And that's, you start talking about the observing mind, as you mentioned. So how do you differentiate between those two mental states? Yeah. Well, one easy way is that the monkey mind is very painful. Mm -hmm. And so you see that the challenge becomes, how do we make that shift? And it's not what we actually think. So meaning that we can't think our way out of the monkey mind, which is even oftentimes a lot of therapy is really helpful. Cognitive behavioral therapy, which is sort of the base foundation of what most therapy is based on. But if you look at it, I've encountered so many people who knew too much for their own good about their own conditioning. I mean, it's just classic. They can define their trauma. They can tell you exactly how it was related to the way they were raised and how their mother or father treated them and all that. But when it comes to the fight or flight response, they still do the same behavior. Yeah. So knowing something intellectually doesn't make you capable of shifting it. And this is why a lot of people don't change, are not able to get past their addiction. Mm -hmm. What it requires is to build a different skill. Mm -hmm. And the skill is to actually attune to this emotional body. Yeah. So meaning that we have to develop courage. We literally have to develop courage our mind tells us that the experience is too scary. It's too painful. Whatever story that we pile on top. But when we help people navigate their emotional body and I ask them, was it as bad as your mind made up the story that it was? And every single time they say, actually not. Mm -hmm. I actually feel better now that I was able to experience this anxiety, experience this grief, experience this anger that was really festering in my body. So the shift to an observing mind actually comes from the intelligence of the emotional body, the able to attune to that emotional body. I love that. I love that. Well, it's interesting. I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me, Dr. Mala, but Jeff, when you talk about courage, I'm reminded that that's from the French word, la coeur, heart. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. right? The monkey mind, the observing mind, it does take courage to say, the rules that were imposed on me are not rules that are a good fit for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you teach someone, and, and I know you've had tremendous success, I love the stories in the book, Dr. Mala and I were talking about how helpful they are to have these characters that we can follow and see them break through. What has been most effective for you at teaching courage? How do you get someone to take action mm -hmm. that's so different and, and for them to say, you know what, maybe my rules are different maybe that, that that the norms aren't the norms for me I, I think of people the lgbtq community right the courage to come out mm -hmm. uh, as a recovering alcoholic it's not the same but historically a bit marginalized and someone saying i have this thing how do you teach that to someone what a beautiful question thank you for that cliff i have experienced over and over that learning to trust the emotional body is not what we think it is. I'll give you an example. If I think any one of us can relate to a major event that's happened in our lives, let's say somebody close to us has died, or maybe we lost a pet, and there's a tendency to just want to resist the grief. And I think there's been a time, I think most people have one time where they've actually surrendered to the grief. They've actually let the grief take its course. And at the end of that grief, they found peace. They found a moment of, oh, wow, this wasn't as horrible. And not feeling the grief never brought me to this calmness. Denying my grief didn't bring me there. So the understanding of courage comes from those experiences of knowing that the emotional body is an ally that is beyond any ally we could ever dream of. Mm -hmm. And so if we believe in the emotional body, if we basically start with one experience and build on that, we develop more courage because courage is not blind, right? It's like, if somebody says jump off the cliff and they haven't taught you how to put a parachute on, <laughs> you know, like you're probably not going to jump, you know, I mean, that would be stupidity. So courage doesn't mean that we're blind. Courage actually means that we align with a deeper truth of what we know can help us. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I want to go deeper. I want to give you an example of what I've developed now. I'm actually getting ready to publish my next book. It's called Aviv La Vie, An Adventure in Belonging. And I take Addicted to the Monkey Mind kind of like to the next step out in the next level. And one of my dream was to simplify it even more. How this came about is when I was working with therapists, I was doing continuing education and we were working at the center with groups. And I would talk to the therapist and I would say, are you seeing that at the core of every issue, no matter where the person's background, where they come from or what's happening, the core of the distress comes back to their sense of love and value is put in question. Yeah. Yeah. And it was stunning to watch that it didn't matter what the issue was. Mm -hmm. And years and years and years of revisiting that and then watching the mind who wants the monkey mind, who wants to refuse that truth. Because the monkey mind, remember, really truly functions from criticism. So if we suddenly introduce that there is no problem, there's nothing to criticize, and that the real issue is that we're actually putting in question our sense of love and value in that moment, wow, that's too much. Like our conditioning wants to like, run the other way, you know? Right. So courage is essential. So in my new book, I talk about th the three doors, okay? And the three doors are way out of this conditioning. And we tested this out with, in small group settings over and over and over, and the results is absolutely phenomenal. It's just beautiful to see. So let me walk you through them briefly. Yeah. So door number one, is the ability to recognize when you are triggered. And there's a signal when we're triggered 
because we're about to say something that's going to come out of our mouths and we can sense, let's say, for example, let's say your partner says, you know, why can't you just pick up after yourself? Or, you know, I'm always emptying the dishwasher. You know, why can't you? And then the words are about to come out of your mouth. You feel the signal of the reaction. I've worked hard all day, right? And as you feel this urge and this impulse, you introduce a breath and you breathe into your body. And before you say anything, you stay and breathe as, as much as you can. And you visualize, in your, like in your mind's eye, you actually see the response of your partner. You imagine right then and there, and you can do that very rapidly, you saying, <laughs> I've worked hard all day. And then you hear your partner said, so have I. Mm -hmm. And now you're in a visceral experience in that moment where the conflict is already alive before you even act it out. So courage, as I was saying, is based on an understanding that we are so smart that courageously we will follow what we know is best. The reason we react is because we don't take the time to observe where does this reaction leading us. We don't pay attention to the results. So by taking a step back, and it's a little bit of a muscle to build initially, people can actually can get this pretty rapidly because as soon as you visualize the outcome, you can then pause this narrative. So that's door number one is you pause it. You basically say, okay, this is definitely not, I've lived through these conflicts hundreds of times this is not the direction I want to go. Now this is where your courage starts to build. Like now you have a little bit of a grip on courage. Now you go to door two. Door two is you say to your partner, I need a minute to gather myself. And I'm teaching the people now that this is really important the way you say it, because you're not leaving the person, you're not abandoning the conversation or whatever. You're simply saying, I need a minute to gather myself. As you walk away, now, this is where the heavy lifting happens. It's about shifting from the initial emotion is about the stimulus and the other person. So the thought of when I'm thinking my partner is irritating because they're so demanding of asking me to empty the dishwasher, notice that the emotion of irritation is about the other person, about the situation. In door two, what we do is we move away because that's the pausing. We pause that narrative and we move away from the tendency to keep following a thinking that, that is aimed at the other person or the stimulus. We pause that. And now we go inward towards the anxiety that lives in our body. And this anxiety is there every time. Yeah. And this anxiety is living in the pit of my stomach and I'm afraid of that anxiety. And in that moment, it makes sense. And so we go sit somewhere and we breathe into that anxiety. And this is where we actually coach ourselves. I will oftentimes say, and I've seen clients practice this, okay, I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. I won't abandon you now. You're obviously really anxious right now. And now what starts happening is the courage builds even further because now what starts happening is I'm giving myself the very thing I did not receive growing up, which is attuning to my emotion and saying, what's here? What's present here? And what starts happening is that rapidly all these, these feelings of inadequacy are going to rise up to the surface without even thinking. The possibilities of, for example, of I can't say no to emptying the dishwasher, even in a calm way and said, oh, not right now. I might get to it later. But it's like, how come? Well, because my sense of worth is tied in to the dishwasher. Mm -hmm. And so, but I can't get to that. If you ask the person before you do the three doors and you said, do you believe that your sense of word is tied to emptying the dishwasher or not? The person would go, well, of course not. But emotionally, that's not what they believe. The, the belief exists in the body. As soon as the partner says it, in the pit of the stomach exists this feeling of inadequacy. 
And the way to actually navigate this belief is to get to it emotionally first, get to the inadequacy and feel what that feels like in the body. Now, when that happens, we see people experiencing a deeper pain. Usually there'll be sadness that will show up underneath the anxiety, which is the pain of feeling like your self-worth has been put in question. That's painful to experience that. Yet, the building the muscle to actually experience it, as we give attention and attune to our emotional body, we naturally come back to ourselves, to our sense of worth. Mm -hmm. And it's not intellectual now anymore. Now, the last step that we do is simply ask ourselves, where's my sense of love and value right now? Mm -hmm. Has it gone away? Because my partner asked me to empty a dishwasher. Now it's solid in the body. It's like, this is where the body informs the mind. It goes right back to the mind because the body is in a secure place now. It's in a place of complete acceptance and realizing, yeah, in my body, I get it. The dishwasher, empty or not, does not change who I am. I am this person. I'm a lovable, very worthy person because I allow myself to experience the pain. Not so much because anything outside changed. Now I can go back to my partner and said, It's fascinating. I was making up a story that somehow I wasn't enough because I didn't empty the dishwasher, but I realized I need a break. I'm going to go walk the dog. And you know what? When I come back, I'll empty the dishwasher. Thanks for pointing it out. There's no, right? Like the resolution has come out of this ability to pause the narrative, attune to the emotional body and verify that the self word is still intact. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a process that we have have tested so much, and I was so excited when I really was discovering the basis of how this really works, and it's really true. And the monkey mind is still sort of very aggressive in this process it, because it's especially aggressive in the first door, right? <laughs> because our urge to want to react is enormous, right? right? So the, the first skill to learn is really pausing this narrative. So, and I was gonna ask at that first door, so many people end up encountering that and thinking that courage means pursuing the fight, right? So thriving on conflict, how would you suggest individuals to navigate through that? I'm so glad you said that. For years early on, I've been married for 31 years, you know, and early on in my marriage, I used to believe that if I walked out on an argument, that meant that I didn't care. Right, right. Okay, so here's the thing. There's nothing caring about a monkey mind <laughs> <laughs> in terms of caring for the other person. Right. The shift to make is to understand that we are wired for connection. Mm-hmm. We are all wired for connection. Yeah. Think if you go to the grocery store and maybe the cashier's in a bad mood or you ask a question, how's your day, whatever, and they just roll their eyes. Immediately in our gut, we'll have this feeling of, oh, did I do something wrong? And so that's because we are feeling creatures and we want to feel and experience each other. Now, here's the understanding about arguments. This is why the door one is so important is when you take a step back and you witness what you're about to say in that moment, every single time you will notice that if you react, you are creating disconnection every time. It's not even one time you can see it before it happens. And that is the antidote to understand that the truth of connection is when you come back, meaning It's our job to manage our reaction, to manage and and attune to our emotional body, to manage this core belief that somehow our sense of worth and value and love is somehow put in question, not logical. And when we restore that, we come back and then we have connection. Mm -hmm. So the important part is to know that in a partnership, we have to make this agreement with our partner that taking a pause is a healthy thing. Mm -hmm. And the partner will build trust as we come back. And even more than that, 
I know for me, when I really started implementing that, what I saw was my partner looking at me like, wow, I like when you take those pauses <laughs> because you come back a much more aware man, less reactive. You're now, you're really there and present with me. You're not reacting to what I'm saying. Right. Yeah, we're, we're, we're not allowing the amygdala hijack to occur, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And it's a skill. And nowadays, I would tell you, do not attempt to think that you can debate your way out of this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things... Go ahead, Dr. Miles. I was just going to say, no, it's such a common misconception. You know, even the Gottmans talk about it. And it's part of, like, our modeling for marriage and family is that you go into a fight thinking you've got to prove yourself there's you're trying to prove the other person wrong and then that dynamic just feeds and fuels that want to pursue the conflict and you're right you're so right taking that break and then coming back is such an important exercise because you're enabling yourself to have that breather to take the time to connect to bring that awareness to be the observer and then also practice empathy to see it from the other person's viewpoint to be able to come back and connect and then share. So absolutely. Yeah. This is beautiful. Yeah. But, yeah. Right, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was just going to say, I'm coming back to your program and the beliefs, right. And, and the conventions that were taught in the rules. And for a lot of us, there wasn't a lot of space for failure. Mm -hmm. And there was a punitive system, right, for performance, right? You get an A and you're good, or you get this and you're bad, et cetera. Do you do a lot of work with teaching people that failure is normal? Like in a lot of really good businesses build into their core values, kind of a fail forward, right, concept of like, we have to take risks. We're going to try different things. We're going to fail. That's okay. You have psychological safety. Do you see that a lot with people that are absolutely petrified? Maybe perfectionism? Is that something that you see a lot? Absolutely. The most important aspect of failure in this context is it's never too late to stop the debate and the reactiveness. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to be aware of. So meaning that we're not encouraging reactiveness, right? Saying, because... You know, we could say failure is like, go ahead and react and react and react and react. It's like, well, that's not going to serve you. It's more the skill of realizing as soon as you see it, that you're caught in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, like I notice, I, I think everybody can relate to this. You start a reaction and then at some point in the debate, you go, how did I get here? It's like, it's like the song from the talking heads, you know, like, how did I get here? That's exactly what I mean. Yeah. When you mentioned that, I was, how did we get here? It's like, what, what happened? Like, this is not your beautiful house. This yeah, is not your it's like, place. this is not it. Like, what? I don't even know what the conflict's about or I don't, you know, but boy, is there tension and friction and like, oh, uh, you know, absolutely failure is essential. And at the same time, it's, failure to consciousness, to awareness. Mm -hmm. So meaning the goal of failing is not to encourage us to fail, but the goal is to fail heavily to ignite a consciousness so that as soon as we become aware, then we can pause. It doesn't matter how far we've gone. That's the essential understanding of that. I want to give you another example I think that can illustrate this really. Let's say we take a couple again. One partner says to the other, I need you to show up more. And the other partner says, stop pressuring me. So we have two dynamics, right? And if we take the moment and go, oh, well, if I take the time to listen to each partner, I could go, oh, yeah. It's like you, you feel alone and you want support. Oh, that makes sense. And the other partner, well, you feel like there's a lot on your plate and you want to take a break. Yeah, that makes sense, right? So you can easily just, if you're not involved in this debate, you can easily be compassionate, okay? The thing is, we didn't receive this growing up. It wasn't modeled for us, right? This is the dynamic that was played out for most parents was like this constant sort of way of interacting. 
if we pause for a minute, imagine what a healthy response would be, meaning a healthy communication would look like this. One partner would say, I really miss you. I've been doing a lot around the house and taking care of the kids, and I really miss you. Like, I miss doing ordinary thing with you. I need to, I miss having you side by side, and, and my heart really aches. Mm -hmm. So what do we have now? What we have is communication, but what we have is emotional communication right. yeah. versus the other communication is trap in a monkey mind that says, I need you to be different in order for me to fulfill my happiness or right. So, and the other person, what it might look like, they might say something like, you know, I noticed that I have put a lot of expectation on myself. I try to meet all these goals at work and everything. And I'm feeling stressed out and stretched in all the direction and stuff. And I'm just like running with, like, I'm not enough somehow, you know, like, and I'm scared. Now, what do we have? It's like, we immediately feel empathy. Mm -hmm. What we have is two people communicating their experiences, mm -hmm. not what they're expecting of the other person and not how the world should be different or blaming or any of that. So how do we get there? Yeah. Because when we're able to communicate in that way, we can return to the issue, whatever issue that needs to be resolved about the partner showing up more or whatever, that can be talked about, mm -hmm. but not during a strong reaction when the emotion is not being addressed. Yeah. And the emotion never gets addressed unless we have the courage to descend in ourselves and tell the truth right. of what the real feeling is. And if you notice again, the feeling will be connected to my sense of lovability, my sense of worthiness. Right. Right. Walking through the three doors, what I notice is that allows me to then communicate like that with my partner. Mm -hmm. The more I do those three doors, the more I naturally now quickly can go, instead of reacting, I go, oh, let me go deeper. And then I actually demonstrate the, the outcome of the three doors with my partner. I can actually go there directly, eventually. Mm -hmm. It takes time, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's so true. And what you're describing here is so avoided. Like you said at the beginning, you know, society, it's baked into society, being genuine with those emotions, being rigorously honest, as we say, you know, that is something that creates fear for so many, because what do we have to maintain this like hard exterior that doesn't feel <laughs> when in reality, the courage is seen in expressing those feelings and allowing yourself to feel and expressing them. So beautifully said, beautifully illustrated. I'm so excited for this new book that's coming out as well. I thoroughly enjoyed Addicted to the Monkey Mind, and I highly recommend it to everyone that I meet. And it's a wonderful, wonderful piece. So I'm very excited for Be Lovey. When is that scheduled to come out? It's going to come out in September, okay. the third week of September. We started creating groups, both in recovery and outside of recovery. Mm -hmm and following the same principles. And I did a lot of pilot groups and the results are phenomenal. It's amazing to see that there's a really simple skill to develop and it does require a lot of courage initially because like you said, we're fighting. We've never learned to prioritize connection and there's two levels of connection. One is to our own emotional body and the other is to having confidence that we can communicate how we truly feel and what we're experiencing with other people, right? But once we have that, we have, you know, what Adler talked about was having what truly creates happiness is he calls it a community feeling. Mm -hmm. And I, I was really stunned to really study how Adler understood the importance of connection, right? He really knew that was true. And I've, definitely lived it in the last 20 years. And, and now that I see a simple path to help people get there, it's so beautiful. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Dr. Mala, I, I, I'm guessing we're probably getting close to running on time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's so much more. There is. JF, that there's so much more. I feel like we just scratched the surface, but I think important from my perspective, I, I want to thank you as someone in long-term recovery, 
I'm just so grateful for people that commit their careers to helping those of us that need help. And yeah, and I hope I get more time with you. I would love to spend more time with you. We would love to spend more time with you. So I'm confident that we will get more opportunities in the future. Yeah. So. Absolutely. There's a couple things also. So I have a podcast. Oh. Well, I actually have two podcasts. The The second one is just kicking off now next week. But the first podcast is called Aviv Levy. It's based on the principles of my book. And, and so you can check that out on YouTube. And there's also, I'm starting a, a second podcast that is way overdue. And it's called Let's Get Real About Addiction. Uh. And my goal is to have guests that I actually navigate the three doors live with people. Oh. And so that eventually we can demonstrate this over and over. And so it kind of takes a little bit of somebody who has a little bit of courage to do this, right? Because it's kind of like live, like Dr. Phil or something like that, right? But I feel confident that from what I've seen is people have told me over that witnessing the process has been the most powerful way for them to learn it. So it'll be fun to, I'll take one person at a time. Probably initially I'll work more with people who are not necessarily in the trenches, but I've kind of like, I've had some, maybe a year or two of sobriety and, and then helping them further on their path. That's great. Um, yeah. So we ask everybody one last question and that is what does recovery mean to you? I would say that recovery is about peace of mind for me, that it's about peace of mind and love, that there's a depth of love that is so alive in all of us. Yeah. Once we're able to get past mm -hmm. all the trauma, the suffering, the monkey mind, what we're left with is how much love there is right here, right now. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Like Cliff said, we definitely have to have you back and I'm excited for additional future potential collaborations with you. Absolutely wonderful to have you on. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I'll send you guys the, the new book when it comes out. Please do. Yeah, please yeah. do. Yeah. Merci beaucoup, mon ami. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Merci. Right. This is wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.